to all. I'll quickly give you an update on the laboratory diagnosis. For most of you, it will be a sort of a revision, except for maybe a few points. So having said that, I proceed. So this is the recent diagram that has come in the journal Pathogens, which gives a nice overview of the time course of leptospirosis and diagnostics. So as you can say, the incubation period can vary from two to 20 days. Leptospiremia is in the first week, followed by leptospiruria. So initially blood cultures and PCRs are positive in the bloodstream, plasma being the best sample. Then you have intermittent shedding. And then finally, the, uh, in the second week onwards, the immune response kicks in with the IgM peaking and then the IgG persisting for a longer time. So the lab diagnosis, basically, finally, whatever, however good the lab is, the sample makes the difference. It is like garbage in, garbage out. If it is a bad sample, we can expect a bad result. Of it. So having said that, blood we can take daily for culture in the first week. Best is a bedside inoculation, one to five drops in five to 10 ml. Urine, second to sixth week. And we have to remember that it is not a uniform shedding. It's an intermittent shedding, both in the human humans and even in the animals, including the rodent host. CSF, body fluids and tissues are other samples in those rare cases where there is disseminated leptospirosis. And of course, the antibody detection is the fifth day onwards, and this is mostly the IgM ELISA. The MAT starts getting positive actually from the, the second week beginning onwards. And of course, we have molecular testing. The blood, is, the plasma sample is the best sample. And of course, urine once the second, the patient moves on to the second week of illness. So this is just an overview of the laboratory diagnosis. The direct methods are microscopy, culture, molecular methods, and the indirect methods, um, the microscopic agglutination test, the ELISA, and the rapid diagnostics. So microscopy requires a minimum amount of leptospires. It is easy to do if there is a, a, a dark field microscope around or if you have uh, antibodies to detect the leptospire antigen by immunofluorescence. But you need at least 10 to the power 4 leptospires per ml. And this is how it looks. Though it looks easy, most of the time uh, we can get uh, confused with RBCs because especially the RBC membrane can give us a false positive. Immunofluorescence is better, but again requires uh, infrastructure and also the relevant specific antibodies to detect the leptospira antigen. And of course, the number of leptospires per ml should be quite high. Staining has been done on tissues. Just for the sake of completion, I am putting these two from the Fontana and the Vardin stary. Culture is like for, like for all bacteria or for all microbes, it is the diagnostic gold standard. But unfortunately, the yield is poor, though the specificity is very high. The widely used culture medium is the Ellinger uh, EMJH medium, and the growth is very slow. Here, six to eight weeks for growth. So therefore, diagnostically not very useful, but good for uh, isolating the bug and also for getting zero hours for microscopic agglutination test. So blood will be positive till 10 days DPO. DPO means dates post onset of the clinical symptoms. And though it is, I have mentioned it as one to two drops, up to five drops per ml, 5 ml or 10 ml of the medium can be inoculated and this is best done at the bedside. Then only the yield is going to be good. Multiple cultures better yield, like sepsis. But unfortunately, we cannot sometimes get that because we treat the patient. And urine, the second week onwards, we get urine positivity. And the one hint here is we should collect it in sterile 
uh, phosphate buffer cell line. Otherwise, the leptospires are quite delicate. And during the, uh, even the 15 to 20 minutes time taken from collection to transport to the lab and inoculation into the medium, the leptospires may become non-viable. And of course, selective media need to be put in because there will be contamination. Most often there will be other commensals in the urine. So these are the two aspects which we have to keep in mind while doing urine cultures. So this is just to show the dinger ring. Um, I think you can see my, the arrow here. So this is uh, once the growth occurs, the, it can be seen like this in the tube. Even in the EMGH medium, you can see the dinger rings. Moving on to the microscopic agglutination test. <clears throat> Many of the time we say it is the reference standard, but it's the serological reference standard. It is not the gold standard. Culture is the gold standard. And the best results are given by paired sera. So like all serological assays, you need acute and convalescent sera. So most of the time it becomes a retrospective diagnosis, but it has great importance for epidemiology to identify disease when this patient has presented late and to confirm that so and so zero var may be present, zero group huh? may be present or leptospira is present can be confirmed using the paired zero testing. The reading is taken using dark field microscope and the end point, most of the time we say that 50% of agglutinated leptospires. That is the theory. But actually, when in practice, it is very difficult to see the agglutinated leptospires because they are clumping. So it is best to see the free unagglutinated leptospires. That gives a better hint of what is the titer. Because being a serological test, the titer is very important for us to uh, suspect and confirm the leptospirosis in a given individual. Of course, you need all the zero bars available for testing. There is inter-observer and intra-observer subjectivity, and it detects the zero group, but not the zero bar. <clears throat> so this just shows you the 50%. So you see what is not agglutinated here. Here, hardly any leptospira you see. So it is 100% agglutination. ELISA, in contrast, detects both IgM and IgG. You can differentiate, whereas in MAT, you detect everything. <clears throat> and it is positive earlier. It is objective because you get a reading. And it can be automated. And therefore, in high throughput labs, in epidemic situations, you can test large quantities, especially in the endemic areas. And in the acute phase, it is slightly better than the MAT. The MAT is around 40 plus percent. This comes around 50% to 60% sensitivity, depending on what cutoff you are using. So this just to show how the ELISA reaction occurs. And moving on to the rapid diagnostic test, because the MAT and the ELISA are all batch testing. You cannot do it on demand. And leptospirosis is an acute febrile illness, one of the uh, acute febrile illness which can be life-threatening. So we need a quick diagnosis. The immunochromatography ICTs, they are good for a quick diagnosis and they can be performed even on a single sample. That is testing on demand. But and this is how, this is the diagrammatic representation. It all looks very nice and clear here. Uh, invalid, valid results, everything. But many times we are presented with results like this. <clears throat> Especially the third column here. Very faintly positive, but most of the time there will be a variation. I will say it is positive. You will say it is negative. Who is right? It's a moot point. <clears throat> we move on to PCR. Everywhere we are now enamored of molecular assays. 
again here in the first week in the blood it is gives the best result the blood is a very good sample the plasma with urine the uh, the results are not so great the common targets some of the housekeeping genes especially the sequoia gene is thought to be good and the pathogen specific lip l32 gene which is the outer membrane lipoprotein and the sequoia is the pre protein translocase it is one of the housekeeping genes and a recent meta analysis says that the sequoia gene pcr is the best pcr if we are going for a pcr diagnosis but remember pcr is dependent on the amount of sample and when the sampling has been done after the first week unlikely we are going to get positives because there is there is no leptospirinia leptospirinuria is intermittent and unless the sample is processed very quickly we may not uh, get positives so the main drawback is the inability to identify the infecting serovar but this is not very important for us as far as clinicians are concerned for treatment this is not informed important we just want to know whether the patient has leptospirosis or not so this is just to show you uh, the other assay which has been uh, pushed forward or is gaining also uh, importance is lamp in a pcr you get a clear cut band like as it is seen here in lamp you get bands like this so the standardization of the protocol by those who have developed the protocol becomes very very important because when you see these bands as you can see here there are more bands here there is less bands these are all so we know this was a pcr positive because we sequenced it but uh, for those who are starting early and who, where there is no expertise a lamp assay sometimes is not so easy to interpret so in before i conclude i will just uh, put in two slides just to show that what is the sensitivity and specificity of the assays available culture though the gold standard the sensitivity is very poor 3 to 28% mat everything if you see has a variation it all depends on what assay was used to compare when the testing was done how the testing was done what cut off was used etc so there is a wide variation in this so the sensitivity and specificity does not tell us much so in the next slide i am giving you some more information so when we have variations in sensitivity and specificity we should do our in house studies and look at the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value the positive predictive value is if the result is positive is it how sure are we that it is positive if you can see all these this sorry most of these assays have quite a good positive predictive value but when they are negative they are we are not sure they are truly negative except the pcr and the rdt gives us a reasonably good negative predictive value 90 so in uh, so this is what ha has been suggested that combining pcr and rdt the rapid diagnostic test which has been well validated and we know is working well in those individuals where other causes of acute febrile illness have been ruled out then we can use these assays because uh, more than the test result coming positive we should know that what is the value of the negative result so with this i conclude my talk thank you